Okay, so um, uh, you know I'm cheating. I have the the answer key here, um, which is the way that I do things. So if you if you happen to know which number um, lecture notes your question comes out of, then I can go right to it. Uh, well, I can tell you the page number from Word Alone. Okay. What's the first question? Um, the first question is on the first one from the homework. Okay. And uh, it's about poles and zeros, I believe. It's about like, right. zeros and deriving rho and omega and zero. Right. Right. Um, okay. So that's. Um, so page 43, I feel like, is the most helpful page. Right. I think that's right. Okay. So uh, basically, um, you know, I just want you to do the algebra to get me, um, you know, given, given the uh, <coughs> the real part and the imaginary part. I want to know uh, rho, and the radius is the distance is one over rho, and I want to know the um, um, the omega zero. So is this some sort of like sine cosine problem? <coughs> um, omega zero is like the Rotation and radius. You know, omega, omega zero is the angle from right. the the real axis. That's right. what that arrow is supposed to mean right there. Um, so, um, uh, if you uh, let's see, if you make a, a a triangle here, okay, then um, um, the imaginary part of Z zero is going to be the um, or Z naught. The imaginary part of Z naught is going to be the height above the real axis, and the um, the real part of Z naught is going to be the um, um, the displacement from the origin along the real axis, right? So, um, and then the you know the left hand angle of that triangle is uh, omega zero. Right. Um, so just the uh, the simplest possible geometry you can think of. But it's nothing, nothing right. more than that. Okay. That's what we were thinking. <clears throat> um. Will you say that one more time? What's the the so the. If you made it, because like this is what I was saying before, I was like, it's this diagram, it's trigonometry, you know. Right. So the. So let me see if I can, uh, if I can draw on this. Um, um, you've got you've got uh, this root z naught, right? There it is, yeah. and um, you're given the real part and the imaginary part, which, like, if you look in a um, in a station response specification, you know, deep inside a um, um, oh, what is it called? A seed archive, you know, for uh, for an event or a seismogram. Okay, um, it'll give you a listing of these z knots in terms of their real and imaginary parts, um, and they'll all be, you know, the magnitude is the row. The row is always going to be, um, you know, close to one. Um, you know, not uh, um, um, uh, you know, it's not going to be uh, the the distance from the origin is not going to be five, you know, and uh, it's also you'll probably notice it's also not um, unlikely to be inside the unit circle, so it's just it's just going to be these uh, you know x uh, x and y that are uh, that are between, uh, you know, half and and uh, or between the square root of two and and two or three probably. And so you know, look having having that um, that z naught listed for you in in uh, in the seed 
directory or in the seed uh, uh, archive. My question here is, uh, you know, how far is it from the uh, uh, the unit circle? You know, how intensive a filter is it? Because uh, if it's on the unit circle, it's a pretty intense filter. And if it, and then uh, what frequency is it? Is it mainly acting at, which is the omega zero? Um, so uh, let's see. Uh, uh, yeah, it's just some. I need the comment. Oh, it's in the comment tools. That's what it is. Okay, so you know, let me uh, let me square off the the triangle. Um, and uh, nope. <laughs> Did I do a text box? Okay. Better just use a line. Um, so that draw that line's the imaginary part of Z. Right. And then the horizontal line is going to be the real part of Z. And then what's the hypotenuse? Right. Well, so that's part of the question. You know, here's a here's a right angle, but yeah. So what is the uh, the hypotenuse is uh, one over rho. Um, Are we supposed to be deriving rho, so we should know that before we start, right? No, you don't know rho, but you know um, you know the imaginary part and the real part. So we just square and get the square root of the whole. Thing. That's that's it. Yeah. That's uh, that's one over rho. Yeah. yeah. Um. And then, uh, um, and then, how would you get? You know, omega zero is this this angle in here. Uh, and so how would you get that? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That makes sense. I mean, at that point, can you say that you know one over rho once you drive it the first time, and then use that? To no, no, no. So what I what I what I give you what I give you is is the real part and the imaginary part. Right. Um, and they're both real numbers. You know. The real part of z naught is a real number. The imaginary part of z naught is a real number. Right. So that's that's all there is to it. Um, yeah, these these Clairbot questions are are uneven. Some of them are are you know if you're if you're thinking about it to the degree you have with this one, um, it's too much. Um, if uh, uh, there's other ones where they're insoluble and and we just want to see how far you can take it. And uh, there's no indication in the question which type that is. I still don't get how we get to to go to one over row there. So so okay so the definition here in the, the polar form of the definition right. Um, and it's all right here. So the uh, this um, um, so are we supposed th to that use those that definition of z zero in our like in our equation like our Pythagorean? Um. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is this is giving you a hint about what. You know what omega zero is and what rho is, right? And um, uh, right. So there's the there's the definition of e to the i omega zero, right? Um, and um, um, so that's the uh, the polar form. Now now. Um, when you when you write a the polar form of a of a um, um, when you write the polar form of a um, a two D coordinate, right? It would be something like you know z naught is equal to r times 
um, <clears throat> the uh, this uh, you know e to the uh, uh, i omega zero. Um, so um, you know because the uh, um, the uh, um, uh, because the <clears throat> the r would be, is the distance from the origin. Okay, so so given the relationship between between this and and the uh, and this equation, then then what is r, what is rho equal to? I mean, rho has to be equal to one over r, right? right. Yeah. yeah. So that's, and then, um, right. And here, here r, you know, r is given. It's 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 noted as one over rho, and that's a distance from the origin. So again, it's just right out of that triangle. I mean, you couldn't just do the inverse tangent of the two legs of that to get the. That'll give you omega zero. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I, you know, I claim to, uh, you know, in this class and in '77, I claim to do all this, you know, partial differential equation stuff, and it just—it's always boiling down to, uh, you know, sines and cosines. You know, that my—I use my trigonometry more than I use anything else in, in my whole career. <laughs> Good. I understand trigonometry. <laughs> yeah. See, so you can. <laughs> You can you can make it. <laughs> All right. Okay. Can we move to the next one? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> one's on the Ricker wavelet. Right. Yeah. No. Oh, what's is it? No, 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 not yet. Is it? Is it? Oh, yeah. All right. Sorry. Yeah. Whatever. Sorry. I thought that was like the third one with the with the program. Oh, okay. So, um, is this the second question, or yeah, right? Figure one point nine, whatever that is. Um, okay. So, um, really, this is a. Um, um, let's see. I wonder if I can find figure one point nine. Um, let's see. <clears throat> when we've been talking about this too, it seems like we keep talking about from zero to pi, and I think we were just kind of confused about what was going to happen after that, whether it was going to be a mirror or um, how it's going to function. Right. Right. Yeah. So the 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 first question is um, how many. Um, you know that spectrum um, represents um, uh, let's see yeah I, okay I gotta I gotta go to the uh, um, I gotta go look at that figure again before I can I can guess. Uh, let's see. Where? Oh, if I go to lab two. <clears throat> right, and there's the link to figure nine. Okay, right. So this is a z-plane figure. Um, um, so um, let's see. Um, okay, maybe I can go to z-plane. Um, 
Um, but it's still only goes to Exactly. Right, right, so right. Is what right. So once we once we see this in Z plane, I'll I'll be able to explain uh, a bit a bit more. Um, Okay, so the um, the first thing they did was was they put a bunch of zeros, um, you know, kind of near the uh, near pi, right? Okay, and there's that nice um, um, uh, yeah yeah. Um, I've only got. Um, Oh yeah, that's why. Okay. Um, you know, saw a bunch of zeros there. A nice Gaussian on the uh, uh, on the T. All right. So um, um, now um, the zero I managed to get. Okay, now I finally managed to get a zero right at pi. Okay. Um, and um, so let me, oops, let me actually take them back. Okay, so here we got the integrator. Okay, the zero is at pi. In the whole z plane, how many zeros are there? In the whole z plane. Right yeah. now? Yeah. Exactly, and where is it? So, so where is that in terms of real and imaginary parts? Well, it's all the way on the real axis. Yep. Minus one on the on the yeah on the real axis. Okay. All right. Now, now I'm gonna I'm gonna move this zero and put it just slightly away from pi. Now notice notice how much the shape of the spectral response changed. It changed radically. Why was that? What happened when I moved the the zero away from pi and put it at just a little bit less than pi? It's no longer an imaginary parts. Um, how many how many zeros are there on the whole z plane now? Um, so this is at you know this is at uh, no, no what is it it's at um, um, let's see it's at three point one one it's not at pi you know it's it's like at uh, uh, ninety nine percent pi right so is it on the real axis right but. But there is a, there is a. The, oops. Okay, I got to point at it again. There is, there is an imaginary part there. Okay, so if we took that one zero, and um, and we made the the uh, the filter time series, um, uh, that is is that filter going to be uh, going to be real? Because there's an imaginary part here, so what do we do? What do we do when we want to put the zero, you know, anywhere but on the real axis? What do we have to do? Yeah, uh, conjugate, uh, uh, complementary, you know, whatever you want to call it. But it's it's the there's a there's another you know. So this one, this one is at, and I can't point at it. Sorry, uh, maybe I no, I can't point at it. <laughs> um, this one is at at you know minus 0.999 on the real axis and plus uh, uh, 0.02 on the imaginary axis, right? So what's the um, um, where's the other zero going to be? Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be at minus 0.02 something on the on the imaginary axis. 
So there's two. That's why the that's why the spectral shape changed so radically because now there's two zeros. You know, move it back here. Okay, only one zero. You know, move it. Uh, you know, one pixel off, and there's and it's uh, there's there's exactly uh, there there's exactly two zeros. That's why the shape changes so much. Now, if you have if you have one zero, the time domain filter has two samples, right? Because it's it's just uh, there's just one root. It's a it's a first order uh, z polynomial, and there's one root, right? And so the the other thing that really changes radically when we move it just off the the axis is um, um, now we have a second order polynomial, right? There's three terms, second order. There's two roots, so there's two zeros. Okay. So um, <clears throat> um, let's say I put the zero here. Okay. Um, it's still a second order polynomial, although even though the, you know, the the z to the first power one is is near zero, it's still there. Um, and uh, um, where's um, so this one is at? Uh, let's see. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty close to the unit circle, and uh, and it's at um, um, pi over two, roughly. Okay, let's say it's at pi over two. Um, Where's the uh, where's the other zero? It's right right on the unit circle, right? And it's it's at minus pi over two. So so what do you think? Um, you know, as we go from from zero to pi, okay, we are um, we're going counterclockwise from the real axis, you know, up. And then uh, and then back to the negative real axis, right? And and as we do that, you know, when we get to let's see, I do it from your perspective, you know, as we get to pi over two, there's this hole in the spectrum there, right? Because the zero is pretty close to the the unit circle, okay? And then we we go away from it, and the spectrum goes back up, right? Okay. Zeros decrease, poles increase, okay. Now there's also uh, there's you know below the real axis there's also a zero uh, down here at minus pi over two. So if we keep going around, right? You know, and it doesn't matter whether we're, we come to minus pi over two or it's 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 three pi over two. Okay, um, you know we're we're going to hit that zero, and the spectrum is pretty much going to look like that. Um, so this could also be. Um, um, the uh, um, this could also be the spectrum from uh, uh, let's see so zero to pi and then we go from pi <coughs> so so let me let me run along the axis here okay so so or I'll run along the spectrum okay we're going up from zero we get to pi over two we're at a hole in the spectrum we climb back up out of the hole we get to pi. Now I'm going to go from pi uh, up to two pi, okay, and I'm going to be coming back, right? I'm going to be getting close to that that zero at three pi over two, right? And and I'm at three pi over two, and then I'm I'm coming up to two pi, which is really just getting me back to zero, right? So this spectrum from from uh, um, because because this zero is not on the real axis. You know, there's there's another there's a conjugate zero down at, at minus minus pi over two. Okay, so now now let's make the the, the Ricker wavelet. Okay, there's my Gaussian. All right, and and I've got one zero at at minus minus pi. Um, I'm sorry. I've got one zero at pi, okay, and I got a whole bunch of zeros, you know, some just a little bit less than pi, and then all their comp, all their conjugates just a little bit more than pi, 
Okay. Now, when I come over here and I add the zero at um, I add the zero at at zero, I've added just one zero, right? It's still it's on the real axis, right? And that's the uh, that's actually the first derivative of the Gaussian, right? I added the zero, so I differentiated the Gaussian. Okay. Now I'll put another one there. Okay. And there's the Ricker, Ricker wavelet. It's the second derivative of the Gaussian. Um, now, why do I have an inverse Ricker wavelet? <laughs> I don't know. Is that the Ricker? That's what it looks like. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's like a, a 180 degree phase Ricker wavelet. If I, I'd, I'd have to invert it to make what I think of as a zero phase Ricker wavelet. Yeah. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see how would I do that? Another zero? Uh, no, that doesn't help. Okay. <clears throat> anyway, I'll I'll, uh, <laughs> I'll figure that out. <laughs> so why is this so widely used? It seems to say that because we fail to observe the zero frequency is why those zeros are you know right next to zero. But what's, mm. what's the application? Why is this? Because I remember this summer I used it to involve the next synthetics, and I'm wondering why the river wave was so yeah. widely used. What's, um, what's the because it's um, it's uh, um, it, it. You notice it has this uh, this um, um, somewhat off-center shape. And it's actually, you know, that shape, that spectral shape, is actually a pretty darn good match to a lot of exploration seismic data. It's not a very, it's it's not at all a match to uh, displacement seismograms, you know, from seismic networks. Um, but it's a very good match to velocity seismograms recorded by geophones. Geophones um, are are, you know, below their peak frequency of sensitivity, they're extremely insensitive. They, and and they and a geophone. A moving coil geophone has zero sensitivity at, you know, constant particle velocity, which would be zero frequency. Okay, it is it is absolutely zero. All right, um, and then uh, a geophone, you know, will have I don't know, like fifty octaves of flat sensitivity, but then what you're fighting is is the response of the Earth. And high frequencies get attenuated in the Earth so fast that that puts this other uh, you know slope on the other side. It's not quite as steep, but uh, but almost. Um, let's see if I bring in some data, so I can I can bring in that that classic. <laughs> yeah, you got you got it. That's it. Uh huh. Um, if I bring in that classic, um, yeah, here we go. <clears throat> so here's the classic data set uh, that that's in the book as well, and you can see it's kind of monochromatic. You know, the there are some very low frequency surface waves in here, but they're um, you know, the geophones are relatively insensitive to them, and um, there aren't any really high frequencies in here either. Because the source, uh, I mean, it's a it's a fantastic clean um, survey, but the the source, you know, isn't putting out those high frequencies, and they're being attenuated quickly by the uh, by the ground. So uh, let's see if I switch this. Yeah, I mean, look at that. I mean, that's the in blue is the real data uh, spectrum, and the Ricker wavelet is not that bad <laughs> an approximation. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, the reflections I want, the high resolution reflections I want, are pretty much in this peak here, which are which right now are matching the Ricker wavelet. Uh, I don't know, maybe if maybe I could move this uh, back a bit, you know, and make it make it match the actual data a bit more. So so that's why. <clears throat> Um, you know, it's a it's a 
it's a simple, narrow band. Well, now you know just how simple it is, right? Yeah. It's a simple, narrow band um, uh, wavelet that uh, uh, that pretty well matches the exploration data from geophones. So it um, um, uh, it, it's it's uh, you know it gives you some 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 simple theory that that actually matches your data in certain ways, which is very useful. <laughs> Uh, if I uh, if I filter this now, whoa, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I I would say I haven't changed the um, I haven't changed the nature of the data very much. Um, let's see if I go and. Allow this Richter wavelet to be uh, higher frequency, and then I filter. Um, yeah, and, you know I've gotten rid of some of the uh, some of the surface waves, and uh, I've kept the uh, the the. The reflections with the highest, um, with the best resolution, the highest frequency reflections. Okay. <clears throat> okay. So now our next question. Wait. Uh, so for the next one, it was like the. Um, playing with your z-plane tool. And the first question was, why is the hole on the real omega axis with a sinusoidal function in time? I think we all kind of thought that way. Yeah. And then the next one was, explain how a pole on the imaginary omega axis yields an exponential in t. Right. And why does the z-plane not let you put poles or zeros below the real omega axis? Right. Um. <clears throat> So uh, let's see. So that's like the uh, the continuation of the third problem, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay. So I got to find that part that uses the. Uh, um, yeah, here we go. Um, this is the, the 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 tool to use here is this bizarre concept of the. Complex omega zero, right? And that's what you know. What we're looking at in z plane is this, you know, negative, you know, positive real omega zero, negative imaginary omega zero, because that's the useful one. Because that's putting the poles, you know, it's keeping the poles outside the uh, uh, the unit circle. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, we're not, we're not, you know, we z plane could look at the whole negative imaginary omega zero part, but again, you know, we're we're just, you know, we're just going to plot the real omega zero part, uh, and we know that there are conjugate poles in the negative real omega zero part. You know, and we're only going to plot the positive real omega zero part. So uh, that's why we only plot that. So the question here is, you know, what's going on when we have um, a pole that has a positive um, uh, imaginary part of omega zero, and so the um, uh, the key is right here. You know, the 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 one over rho uh, is all everything is absorbed into this. Red complex omega zero, the the distance from the the real axis, the uh, um, you know everything, um, and there's a a real and imaginary part, and the the question is um, the um, the real part of omega zero is is zero, or the 
Uh, what's the... Uh, Explain how a pole on the imaginary omega on the imaginary omega axis yields an exponential of t. So real is zero, I guess. So real is zero, and the imaginary part is... Uh, is Right. So real is zero, right? So... Uh, um, uh, so right, right here, right. That's the real part of omega zero zero, and so you've got i times i times the imaginary part of omega zero, right? And i times i is minus one, right? So you get a the the pole is equal to e to the um, um, e to the the minus 1 times um, the uh, imaginary part of omega 0. Um, so the, um, um, you know, this, this exponential here, there's no i in the exponent, right? So it's not an Euler exponential. It's just a simple exponential. Um, now, is that right? We have um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, <clears throat> right. So uh, uh, the key here is is in um, when you show it's sinusoidal. Um, what you what you actually have to do is go from the representation of the uh, of the of the pole to the representation of the um, um, of the of the time series, the, the the filter time series that's connected to that pole, and that involves another um, um, another exponent. Um, so that takes this uh, negative and 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 turns it positive again, just like uh, uh, just like here. So when you have positive, uh, when the imaginary part of omega zero is positive, then you end up with a positive exponent on that, which is uh, when you actually go to uh, to writing down the uh, the coefficients. So let's see. Um, let's take a look at that. Um, And uh, let me get rid of everything. Uh, okay, I got to put a pole somewhere. Then I can get rid of the zero. Let's put the pole at zero frequency. <clears throat> so here, here is that that single pole. And uh, you know you put it well outside the unit circle up here, and you get this nice decreasing exponential. Okay, and as I bring it closer, right, the the exponential is decreasing. I mean, it's really uh, decreasing very fast there. And I bring it here, and it's decreasing slower. I put it right there, and there's like uh, you know the spectrum is a spike at uh, you know. At zero frequency, and, and notice that it's it's a constant, you know. So there, it's uh, you know, um, um, 
z to the zeroth power, the coefficient of z to the zeroth power is one. The coefficient of z to the to the first power is one. Um, so you have to um, you're, you're kind of dividing out the um, uh, remember a pole is is a a, a rational um, a rational filter. So you have um, um, a numerator in and and there's a one there. And then you have a denominator, which is your uh, two-term um, uh, z polynomial. Okay, that would be like one plus uh, z over z p. <clears throat> okay, so then you start dividing out the uh, you start dividing out the uh, the rational filter. You, you divide that out of one, and um, and that's it's in writing down those uh, those coefficients. Um, that's where you get the uh, uh, the exponential, the exponent on the exponent, which then flips the sign. So if I if I was able to drag this pole lower, um, what happened here? Oh, it's just a big sinusoid. Okay, if I was able to drag this pole lower, it would it would go up. And I think there's an example in the in the book. So. Um, I have to look in the right direction. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I give you the whole history why it's plotted that way. Yeah, usually, reflection people time goes down. Reflection people time goes up. John time goes up. <laughs> I'm looking for time going this way. Yeah, really. Oh, no. That has a meaning. <laughs> That's right. <clears throat> Uh, let's see, which one is this? This is number three? This is no. B, yeah, number three B. Right, right, right. So, do you want us to explain it in words, like based on that z-plane thing, or do you want us to show you in there? I, I want to see the, um, I want to see the, uh, uh, the exponential. Um. So the 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 key is um, is how you uh, is is how you get the the increasing uh, um, coefficients of z to higher powers. Let's see, and there, I know somewhere there's a uh, there's an example. Let's see. Yeah. It really comes out of this. So, you know, where where do you somewhere, you know, row is 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 actually where you put in the the pole. <clears throat> You know, because really, what you want is z over z sub p. And and here, you know, it's it's real. Rho is real. Um, <clears throat> so there's the division done right there. Um, yeah. So you can come up with a simple, um, you know, a very simple statement of the exponential that that gives you, you know, f at any t.
think that's the easiest place to see it. Okay. And it's really, I mean, it's pretty much as simple as this right here. <laughs> um, are you wondering about C? The easiest way is is to uh, uh, look at the Fourier theorems, and uh, we're talking about spectra here, right? So the operator is a second derivative, and uh, and it has that operator has its characteristic spectrum, but actually the second derivative has a Fourier dual, and you can just write down what that is, and that explains the shape of the characteristic spectrum. So often, um, you know, and, you know, this is kind of a question about a filter. You know, what's the spectrum of, of this filter? The filter is a second derivative, but oh, because we're talking, you know, we we want to get the spectrum. All right, you know, you, you get the characteristic spectrum of the filter by, you know, most fundamentally by by Fourier transforming the uh, uh, the filter time series. But you don't have to do that because there's already a Fourier theorem about about what um, what the Fourier dual of the of the second derivative is. <clears throat> then D, we kind of did that a little bit, talking about the Ripper wave right? I mean, we put them all. Like, yeah. Let's see at, at zero. Or, yeah, at zero at on zero. Uh, Derivate the Gaussian into the second derivative, which is the Ritter wave loop. Is that right? This way. Yeah. Um. Right, and and I, you know, in the solution, I make an, a, another suggestion, but you know, we. Uh, um, um, the the way we just did it was was fine too. And then E is is really just looking at this uh, data set. Um, and. Uh, ground rule is the uh, is the service waves. Um, that's just the jargon term for it. Um, you know they're they're not reflections. They're they're interfering in the reflections at zero offset, which is just exactly where we want to see the reflection the most. Um, so uh, um, they're. Um, they're lower frequency. Um, um, and, uh, oops. Uh, let's see. I bet, I bet that's the ground rule right there. Um, so if I filter it, ooh, <laughs> that's horrible. <laughs> okay, I don't want to do that. Yeah, so here's here's kind of a low pass filter because I think this first spike is the ground roll. Let's see, and that's at about twenty five hertz, and the reflections are at yes ab above sixty. Some reflections even at at one hundred and ten hertz. So um, if I filter this, yeah, so that's really emphasizing. In fact, that's a nice emphasis of um, of all the. Um, uh, you can still see there's still some first arrival in there, um, 
but really, you know, it's taking out reflections and, and leaving uh, mostly the ground roll. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's got to be the the ground roll at uh, twenty five. Yeah, twenty five hertz or so. Um, and yeah, I, it, that's kind of a um, just kind of a test, you know, to uh, uh, a test of your interpretation of, of records. So you literally else. just want us to read the green off of this. You can do that, or you could you could uh, uh, get a screenshot and circle it. Okay. You know, you can tell me it's in the the lower, you know, mostly in the lower right corner. <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I don't even. You know, I, I just want to know that you can recognize it. <clears throat> So what what next before we start lecture? Should we stop there? Yeah, I guess the toilet is a good place to stop. Okay. All right.